from Bloomberg News and iHeartRadio, it's The Big Take. I'm Wes Kosova. Today, nuclear power is back in the conversation. Germany's leaders say the country may need to extend the life of nuclear plants if it cannot replace all its gas imports from Russia. The French President Emmanuel Macron has announced today new measures on increasing nuclear output. He wants at least six new reactors built in the coming decade. Tonight, Governor Newsom just did his part to keep California's last nuclear power plant up and running. Or to Japan now, where the Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has pledged to restart more nuclear power plants to provide energy, as Japan struggles with its hottest summer on record, but 11 years on from the Fukushima disaster. High oil and gas prices have governments looking for cheaper, more plentiful alternatives of power. One possibility that's been around for decades but not so loved? Nuclear. Fears about radioactive meltdowns still linger in a lot of people's minds many years after disasters in Chernobyl in 1986 and at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi plant in 2011. Now several countries, including the U.S., are taking another look. They're considering extending the life of aging plants and possibly building new ones. Bloomberg reporter Shoko Oda covers the energy industry, and she joins me now from Tokyo to explain the government's thinking and how people in Japan feel about turning the reactors back on. Shoko, it's been many years since the Fukushima disaster, and I think the world's memory has faded somewhat. Can you remind us just how devastating this disaster was and really still is for many people in Japan? Sure. Um, really, the Fukushima nuclear disaster was an inflection point for Japan's energy strategy. Everything really changed after this disaster, which was the worst since Chernobyl in 1980s. On March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9 earthquake struck the northeastern coast of Japan. And what happened was massive tsunamis overwhelmed the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant which led to power for cooling systems at the site to be shut off and then nuclear meltdown at the reactors. So immediately after this accident, Japan took all of its reactors offline. At that point, we had 54 nuclear reactors in the country. There was really big public backlash against the use of nuclear. For the longest time, you know, nuclear was a very sensitive topic among the public. And now Japan currently, for electricity, relies heavily on a mix of natural gas and coal and also some renewable like solar. And in the aftermath of that disaster, many people were displaced and had to stay away for a lot of years. Thousands of people still have not really put their lives back together to the way they were before. Yeah, so 12 years after the disaster, uh, the effects are still here. We visited a town in Fukushima Prefecture up in the northeastern coast. But, you know, even though some of the restrictions have been lifted and people are allowed to go back, uh, many have decided to not return because they've already rebuilt their lives elsewhere. It's taken 12 years to get where we are today in Japan, but at the same time, it's hard to kind of gauge how long we've come especially when you come visit these towns um, and see that people are still having mixed thoughts about returning. And now here we have a global energy crisis, which is hitting Japan like it's hitting so many other places. Really something that you couldn't imagine happening just a few years ago is happening, which is people are starting to think maybe it's time to turn nuclear back on. Yeah, I think like everywhere else, Power bills and gas bills in Japan have been rising. Um, And 2022 really was almost like a a year. It was a reminder for Japan how little resources we have and how exposed we are to global turmoil. Japan imports almost all of its energy needs. So the country was really hit hard by natural gas and coal prices surging. And that's cut into the profits of utility companies, which in the end have also led to power bills being rising for households and small businesses. 
So there's been polling conducted by Japanese newspapers that do indicate that people are warming up to the use of nuclear again in the belief that by turning these reactors back on, the utilities don't have to procure expensive fuel from abroad and thus lower power bills. So in August last year, um, Prime Minister Kishida commented that he wants Japan to consider developing next generation nuclear reactors. And that was a big shift because for the longest time since 2011, the government towed around the wording of what Japan will do with replacing nuclear reactors that are being decommissioned or building a completely brand new ones. There was a lot of unclarity about where Japan will be with the future of nuclear. But Prime Minister Kishida said that we need nuclear for energy security, but also decarbonization um, as carbon-free uh, power source. And he's kind of launched this platform to try to have a plan to build new uh, next generation reactors. Not only that, but now the government has a plan to extend the lifespan of existing reactors. So the current rules are that utilities can operate nuclear reactors for 40 years and then get one-time lifespan extension and operate it for 60 years. Now the government is saying that it should be operated beyond 60 if the reactors are safe. So that's a pretty big shift from where we were, you know, 12 years ago. And then with this global energy crisis, the government really kind of gearing up. You mentioned that public polling shows that people are starting to warm up to this idea, but I imagine there's quite a lot of division and mixed feelings and strong emotions. Are people talking about this a lot? It's definitely popping up on local media, local newspapers, also like social media spheres. Um, it's really lingering in the minds of people, whether you're anti-nuclear or pro-nuclear or maybe even conflicted, which I think a lot of people are conflicted. You have this surge in power bills and gas bills. At the same time, you have memories of what happened 12 years ago. It was a really traumatic event for Japan. You know, what do you do? Is nuclear really the answer? You spoke to one man whose family has run a hotel near Fukushima. He left along with everyone else, but has since come back. Can you tell us about his experience? Sure. So we spoke with Tsutomu Hirayama. He's from one of the towns affected by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power disaster. When we spoke to him, he sounded very conflicted and very mixed about the use of nuclear. And he's basically seen both the, the economic benefits of having nuclear power stations in his neighborhood, in his community, but also having been affected by the actual disaster. He's seen like the worst of what could happen. In terms of benefits, he's talked about how the nuclear power plant provided employment for local communities so people could work there. And because the government gives funding to municipalities that do host these nuclear reactors, that money could be used to build public infrastructure and buildings. So there were some benefits. At the same time, He's told me about having been evacuated from the hometown after the nuclear disaster and not being able to return for a few years and being concerned about whether he's able to ever come back to his hometown. You know, it's, it's really a horrible experience. Hirayama has been one of the first to be able to go back to the town, specifically because they needed these construction workers to be able to stay in hotel for the duration of their stay. We actually, when we visited his hometown and spent a night there reporting, we stayed at his hotel, not only at the hotel, but in the restaurants and other areas throughout the town. You could really see that it's really dominated by a lot of construction workers. And it speaks to, I think, even 12 years after the reconstruction process is still really ongoing. And, you know, when I asked Hirayama about this black or white debate around using nuclear power in Japan, he got really pensive and then told me that he could understand both sides and how they both feel. Mm -hmm. 
賛成の人の気持ちも反対の人の気持ちも、うん、どっちの気持ちも分かる。But at the end of the day, he says he's against nuclear because of what to do with、um, the spent nuclear fuels. Which is another question that the Japanese government has to still kind of figure out where the nuclear fuels will go at the lifespan. But at the same time, he knows that by turning nuclear on, if power bills can be lowered, it could really help lower income people, lower income households, and people who are affected by this inflationary pressure. Well, that raises another point, which is we're in the middle of. An energy crisis now where prices are high and people are looking for alternatives. But how likely is it that even if they were to very quickly approve putting nuclear power plants back online and building new ones, that people would actually get that power? So, in terms of building brand new reactors, I think there's a question of whether Japanese power companies today. Have the risk appetite to want to invest in a completely new reactor or let alone replace a decommissioning one with a next generation reactor. I think that's a question to be asked whether the operators even want to do this today, especially, you know, earthquakes are still very much a risk in Japan.、Uh, it's a very earthquake prone country. So you can't say that something like 2011 will happen again or an earthquake that size will happen again. So I think there are some questions whether, you know, despite the government push to use nuclear again, how speedily can that be available or how readily that will be back online? Shoko Oda, thanks for speaking with me today. Thanks for having me. When we come back, Japan isn't alone in taking a new look at nuclear power. Japan is just one country that's weighing new investment in nuclear power. Will Wade is Bloomberg's power and renewable energy editor in New York, and he's here to tell us more. What are you looking for as someone who covers this industry? Well, I've been covering nuclear for several years now, and I would say in the past 18 months, 24 months, There's been a really visible and obvious shift. I say there's a renaissance in nuclear energy these days, and it's because people are realizing they really need nuclear power to help achieve climate goals. There's just no other way you can reach our goals of cutting emissions without using nuclear. Wind and solar are great, you could build lots of it, but they don't run all the time. Only nuclear does that, and that's why we're seeing so much more support for nuclear from so many corners of the world. How is that playing out? So, the thing about nuclear power is that it is clean energy. It's, there's no carbon that comes out of nuclear reactors, and that's really good. But for the past many decades, environmentalists have been really opposed to nuclear power because of the waste that's created from reactors. And it's true, nuclear waste from the spent fuel rods is really, really bad stuff. It'll stay deadly for thousands of years. But there's not that much of it, and the track record is pretty good for the industry. And now that climate change is becoming a very real, very tangible threat, people are starting to say that that real threat is more of an issue than the potential threat of a nuclear accident. So we're seeing a lot more interest in nuclear energy as a key part of the climate solution. And I guess people, when they think about nuclear, a lot of them focused on. The big disasters, Three Mile Island in 1979, or Chernobyl in 86, or of course Fukushima in 2011. But there are a lot of nuclear power plants around the world. What is the、um, kind of balance between safety and advantage? So the thing about nuclear accidents is you just listed them. There have basically been about three in the history of the industry since we started using nuclear power back in the 1950s. So the potential damage is significant. But there have not been a significant number of accidents. So, if we look at, say, Europe, where if we were to take France, which has a fairly well developed nuclear program, how has that worked out? How are other countries looking at the examples of nations that use nuclear power as a model, like what they want to do and what they don't want to do? 
Well, France is a good example. France is the most nuclear country in the world. They get about 70% of their electricity from nuclear power plants, and they're very committed to it. They've said that they want to advance their program even more. They announced last year a big program to expand their nuclear fleet. Other countries are sort of looking at it the same way. The UK gets about 15% of its energy right now from nuclear power plants. They want to make that 25% by 2050. And again, it really comes down to climate goals. People are looking at nuclear as the only clean energy source that runs around the clock. The thing about France is last year they discovered that there were some significant problems. I think uh, 16 of their 56 reactors were down for a significant amount of time last year. They're not all back up. It was a really big problem. France exports electricity throughout Europe. And at a time when all of Europe is saying, we don't want natural gas from Russia, we don't want to get coal from Russia, we need electricity, can we get some from France? And France was saying, no, we don't have enough to go around right now. It's a big problem. I think nuclear generation in France was down about a third in 2022. And that, of course, was happening at the same time that Europe was squeezed by dwindling gas supplies from Russia. Yeah. And not only that, Europe said, we're going to stop importing coal from Russia. So there's no coal from Russia. They're trying to not use gas from Russia. They weren't getting nuclear power from France. That's why that Europe was worried about electricity bill last year. Right next door in Germany, that country shut down its nuclear reactors after the Fukushima disaster. What's happening there now? So Germany shut down most of their nuclear reactors after Fukushima, and they had a plan to phase them all out. The last three were supposed to shut down just in December, a couple months ago. But a few months before that, they sort of realized, oh, wait, we need that electricity. They've extended that until April, so a few more months. It's not huge. There's a lot of people that are looking at that decision and saying, what are you, nuts? You need the electricity. Why shut these down right now? I mean, if you want to shut them down, eventually you can, but right now probably isn't the best time. Building nuclear reactors, new ones, is one thing, and it takes a really long time. It costs a whole lot of money. And so a lot of the conversation is around extending the life of existing reactors. Can you get into the complications of that? When the nuclear power plants are built, they picked a lifespan of 40 years, and they just said, all right, these things, we should run them for about 40 years. We'll license them for 40 years. Most of them have then been extended to 60 years. You can ask for a 60-year extension. A few of them have now got their second extension, I think about six of them in the U.S. So now they're approved for 80 years. And there's another couple dozen that we know that they're probably going to seek that second extension. So a lot of the U.S. fleet now or soon will be approved to run towards 80 years. And I've even heard researchers are starting to study the question, could we extend them to 100 years? Could we have a century-year-old nuclear power plant? So I'm no nuclear expert, but I don't know of anything that runs for 100 years. Is it the best idea to run a nuclear reactor for that long? That's a fair question. The thing to keep in mind is that the maintenance programs are really, really strict. So they shut down every 18 months to refuel them, to put in new nuclear uh, fuel rods. And at the same time, they do a lot of maintenance. Most of the parts are not the original parts. Is it the same plant? Yes. Or is it all the same parts? Mostly not so much. There's a couple of things that can't be replaced, like the concrete floor, the big pad underneath it, the giant containment vessel. Those things can't be replaced. So if you have a problem with that, it's not going to keep going. But they can keep going for a long time. And another thing to keep in mind is, so it is now 2023. And the average age of nuclear plants in the U.S. is about four decades, 40, 45 years old. So coming up on that original 40-year mark. Right. So if we're talking about 60 years old, 80 years old, that'll take us into the 2050s and beyond. Who knows what's going to be available at that time? We may not even need them then. You mentioned the waste problem, and that's always a problem because nobody wants that stuff near them. I remember a few years back, there was this huge argument in the U.S. about burying it in a mountain in Nevada, and there was no political appetite for that, and it got shut down. And I don't know that they've ever really found a place for it. And so how does that issue get solved? How do you safely store 
the waste, which if we increase the use of nuclear energy, there's going to be a lot more of it. And you're exactly right. There was a plan to store it in, under a mountain in Nevada out in the middle of nowhere called Yucca Mountain. And the people in Nevada kind of resisted that. So what happens now is basically every nuclear power plant out behind it in the back 40 has a big concrete pad where they have these giant casks. They're about, I don't know, about 10 feet across and 30 feet tall, and that's where all the nuclear waste is. And they just store them there, every single one of them. And even power plants that have been decommissioned and dismantled, and there's nothing there left except a nice field and the old storage casks because there's no place to put them. And that's a political question because the U.S. government has sort of passed a law that says, yes, the government is responsible for the nuclear waste. They'll make it their problem. And now they don't have a place to put it, so they just leave it there. There are a couple of proposals now to build sort of centralized sites, uh, one in West Texas and one in East New Mexico. They're actually pretty close to each other. They're probably going to get approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission soon, I think this year. So we may soon have a repository for all that nuclear waste. So if you look down the road five years, 10 years from now, do you think we're going to have a significant increase in the amount of energy that comes from nuclear? Five to 10 years? No. The thing about covering nuclear energy is that everything in nuclear moves really, really slowly. In 10 years, we might have the first small modular reactors in operation, but there's going to be a lot of activity pushing towards that. 15 years from now, I think there'll be a lot more nuclear energy. So people who are hoping that nuclear could be the solution for today's energy crunch are out of luck, but maybe by the time the next time we have a world energy shock, we'll have a solution at hand. We'll probably be working towards it, yes. Well, Wade, thanks so much for talking with me. Happy to be here. Nuclear has its upsides, and it definitely has its downsides, as we've heard. So how do you weigh them? That's after the break. We've heard a lot today about the risks of nuclear power. So we thought it would be interesting to ask an unabashed nuclear booster to come on the show and make her case for the upside. Dr. Jessica Lovering is co-founder and executive director of Good Energy Collective. That's a think tank that promotes pro-nuclear policies with a climate change perspective. Our producer, Michael Falero, talked to her about weighing the benefits and risks. So let's talk about where our energy mix is right now. How much U.S. energy is renewables like solar, wind, hydro? How much is nuclear right now? And where could those numbers be going in the next decade or so? So in the U.S. last year, nuclear was about 20 percent of our electricity. And a lot of people don't know that nuclear makes up such a large share of our grid in the U.S. Um, but it's been at 20 percent for a couple decades now. It's been pretty stable and is probably in the next 10 years is going to stay at 20 percent. Fossil fuels are still producing about 60% of the electricity in the U.S., and renewables were at about 22% last year. So most of the growth is coming from wind and solar, and really from wind. Wind uh, was about 10% of our electricity last year, and that's only growing. And if you project kind of those current trends out, we might see renewables hit 40% of U.S. electricity generation by 2030, but there are some serious obstacles and reasons why it might slow down. Um, we might have some kind of friction in getting to higher penetrations of renewables. What are those obstacles with, with renewables that maybe something like nuclear isn't going to face? So a big one is transmission. Renewables are geographically dispersed. You know, a lot of our wind comes from the Midwest. Solar tends to be in the southwest, and we need to move it to where it's needed. And there are limits to how much you can move on the current grid infrastructure, the current transmission system. And it's really hard <laughs> to build new transmission lines, especially the high-voltage transmission lines that you need to move power far distances. Um, so that's one constraint. Another one that, that people don't think about, but is actually a growing issue, is local opposition. So renewables, for the most part, when I'm talking, I'm talking about wind and solar, they take up a lot of land for the amount of electricity they produce. And you might think, okay, well, we have a lot of land in the U.S. Other countries like Japan don't, and they're much more constrained on where they can build renewables. But in the U.S., yeah, we have a lot of land. Is that really a big issue? 
But the reason that it is becoming more of a concern is that if a project takes up a lot of land, it also impacts a lot of communities, a lot of people, and there's much more chance that you're going to have local opposition. Nuclear has its own challenges, but having a diversity of options, particularly ones that are more land efficient, like nuclear, which has a really small footprint and a lower materials requirement, can be really helpful for balancing a clean energy system. So I live in California, and last summer we had a lot of concerns around power shortfall, particularly in the summer on really hot days when everyone's running their AC. And that was a big motivator for why the governor of California, Governor Newsom, announced that he wanted to keep our last remaining nuclear power plant open a few more years. It's supposed to start closing down next year, so extending it another five years because we don't have enough power on those hot sunny days, even though California has seen huge growth in renewables. We have grid-scale storage coming online. It's just not enough. So talk more about this quote that you gave our reporter, Will Wade. You said the calculus is changing on keeping these plants open, talking about nuclear plants around the world. The economics haven't shifted, but the climate economics have shifted. What did you mean by that? So I want to make a point really quick that I think is counterintuitive to most people, which is nuclear is actually really cheap. And so I know that's a surprise to a lot of people. But that aside, when we talk about the economics of nuclear, there's kind of two issues that get muddled together. So there's cost and value. In the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of nuclear plants closing, quote unquote, for economic reasons. And that's really because natural gas is so cheap in the U.S. It's gotten a little more expensive in the last year, but still pretty cheap compared to the rest of the world. And that's what replaces this last generation when nuclear closes, which is really bad from a carbon perspective. But for, you know, consumers, it's not a big deal. So what's causing a rethink now is that governments and utilities are waking up to the fact that nuclear plants provide a lot of value because they are generating electricity 24-7. They're very reliable and they also just happen to be zero emissions. You know, when most of these plants were built, climate change wasn't a, a big concern. They were built for the fact that they just provide a lot of electricity pretty cheaply. And so you're starting to see that reflected in how governments and how utilities are valuing existing nuclear. And you're seeing that with credits being provided in federal legislation in the U.S., but also a reinvestment or new investments in new nuclear. As we're looking towards planning for deep decarbonization or a clean energy transition, we really need to start valuing the clean energy attributes of nuclear and not just treating them like fossil fuels, which is how they are done in a lot of countries. So I think it's safe to say you're a pro-nuclear expert. You think about this all the time, every day. When you tell people in your life what you do and why you're for nuclear power, what do you tell them? That's a good question because I do talk about nuclear with people a lot, talking about what I do. I think the main way that I talk about nuclear is the truth, which is I got interested in nuclear because of climate change. And I think that's something people don't think about a lot. But, you know, nuclear is the largest source of carbon-free electricity in the U.S. Uh, It's the largest source in most countries, unless they have really large stores of hydro. And so if we're serious about taking action on climate change and getting to zero carbon in the shortest time possible, nuclear is just a critical tool to do that. It's not that I don't think nuclear has problems. I think nuclear has a lot of problems, but I want to work on policies that address those problems rather than say, okay, we can't have nuclear because it has some issues. Because really, all energy sources have pros and cons. And so we want to you know, work to minimize the cons of every energy source um, and focus on the benefits, which are reliable, clean electricity. Dr. Levering, thanks for joining us on The Big Take. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at Bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Vergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producers are Michael Falero and Mo Barrow. Rafael M. Seeley is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take.